and it's organized by the Chalmers Museum of Art, featuring works from the Beth Rudin DeVille Woody collection, A Very Anxious Feeling, Voices of Unrest in the American Experience. And it shines light on the widespread feelings of anxiety in contemporary art. Referencing both collective and personal anxieties, the works in this exhibition highlight intersectional voices sharing their dissent, joy, and transcendence. The exhibition amplifies the voices and experience of Latinx and Latin American artists living and working in the United States with all works acquired by Beth Rudin DeWoody over the past 20 years. A very anxious feeling, voices of unrest in the American experience, 20 years of the Beth Rudin DeWoody collection is curated by Amethyst Ray Beaver, assistant curator at 21C Museum Hotel, as well as Eva Thornton, co-curator of this exhibition and assistant curator here at the museum. In collaboration with Laura Dvorkin and Maynard Monroe of the Beth Rudin DeWoody Collection. And you know, this exhibition in educational support is generously presented by the Dorothea L. Leonhardt Foundation, Inc., the Dorothea Leonhard Fund and the Communities Foundation of Texas Incorporated and Joanne Leonhard Casulo. Additional support and sponsorship is provided by Roanoke Arts Commission of the City of Roanoke and Blue Ridge Beverage. And as we know, it's, you know, we need that the funding as we move forward with an exhibition like that. And you'll hear a lot about the programming that's going with it and the reach to our community. I love to share a little bit about Amethyst. And so uh, Amethyst Ray Beaver is the assistant curator, as I mentioned, at 21C Museum Hotel since 2016, where she works on the curatorial programming for all nine of the hotels and locations. And maybe you've already visited one of the hotels, but they're in Louisville, Kentucky, to Durham, North Carolina, and many Midwest locations, Kansas City, Chicago, St. Louis, to just name a few. From 2012 to 2016, she worked at the Blanton Museum of Art in Austin and the Latin American in Modern and Contemporary Curatorial Teams on exhibitions, publications, and public programming. And you'll see that, you know, her, she's a prolific writer as well as speaker. And you'll, you'll, you'll see that in the labels and the interpretive materials as well as hearing from her this evening. And in 2010, Amethyst um, lived and worked and studied in Chile as a Fulbright Fellow, and she received her BA from Lesley College and her MA in Modern and Contemporary Latin American Art History from the University of Texas at Austin. So, and to start us out, I would love to tell a little bit about, you know, how did this even happen? Uh, and this uh, exhibition, and as we know, you know, COVID hit, and not only did we need to close our doors and pivot all of the, the program offerings that we had, but also the exhibition schedule all of a sudden did a turbulent turn. And so some of the exhibitions we had to push out, some we had to um, cancel. And so we were you know, looking at this contemporary gallery um, with what would have been a ticketed exhibition this year in the area of fashion that we were getting ready to go. And so with New York closing down, uh, we had to pivot as well. And so, you know, uh, over a year ago in May of 2019, as well in New York City, as well as in September of 2019 uh, in Roanoke, actually, uh, myself, along with uh, the late Patrick Shaw Cable and Joanne Casulo, one of our board members, as well as Beth Rudin DeWoody, um, we had a conversation about a second exhibition that could come to the Taubman and, you know, we could really take a, another eye to Beth's collection. And so that was kind of that seed that started. But, you know, at that point in time, we were looking at 2022 or 2023 and uh, with that you know we reached out to Beth and Joanne 
and said, you know, what if we move that up and sped up that time for curation that you'll see um, throughout here, but also, you know, put that into our fall programming of 2020. And Beth, was, Beth Rudin DeWoody was extremely generous in making that happen along with her team. And I'd love to give a bio on Beth too. I know many on the phone saw the exhibition from the Pan-African Works of Art, which we'll show, but we're gonna pull on the screen share um, Beth in you know, one of her homes. And Beth DeWoody is a celebrated as a collector, curator, and philanthropist. She resides between Los Angeles, New York City, and West Palm Beach. And her passion and vision for collecting has given emerging and under-recognized artists a national platform for greater visibility through exhibitions at the Bunker Art Space in West Palm Beach and in public institutions across the country. And I did have the opportunity to visit the Bunker and really see that space and what she created. So it opened in December of 2017. It is a you know, 1925 uh, renovated space, about 20,000 square feet. And it was a munitions uh, warehouse at that point in time. And, and she has different rooms and different spaces. And so, uh, you know, looking at that, um, you know, she's been able to share with us the second time. She has over 10,000 objects in her collection. And it, she continues to expand. And her broad affiliations include the Whitney Museum of American Art, who we're working as a partner with as well. So we're so lucky to have this exhibition come here and be able to dive into her collections. And you can see here on the screen share that is at the bunker. And that is um, Amethyst. We can see one of the works of art that'll be in the show. Um, yeah, so the, the, the gentleman looks like he's sitting on, um, on a cinder block. That's actually a work by an artist named Luis Flores. And it's all, it's a, it's a self-portrait of him that he has crocheted, so you can't tell, but it's all it's all um, hand woven with with crochet materials, and he's holding a styrofoam cup. It's called um, morning coffee. So um, yeah, that's one of the works that you'll see in the exhibition, and um, he's he's really interested in thinking about masculinity and vulnerability. So he's playing with these high and low materials. Um, materials that are often considered craft and usually denigrated as something that like women will make. Um, but he has, you know, really embraced these materials as something that conveys not only um, a softness that he personally wants to be able to share with the world, but, um, but a material that he feels that has been undervalued by society in general. There and um, Amethyst, I'd love to have you talk about that curatorial premise and how that started as we brought you into the picture. And you know, we're working with three different teams, the team at the museum, you as the co-curator, and then of course the Beth Rudin DeWoody, uh, it's a collections team. Yeah, no, it was it was really fun. I, I loved being able to work with Eva and to get to spend time on the phone and, and on Zoom with Laura and Maynard from the um, from the DeWoody collection. When I got brought into the project, they had done a lot of the original, a lot of the legwork. They'd pulled together works from the collection that um, were all artists of Latin American descent. Um, and there was an original list of about 670 works. So there were a lot to consider. They had narrowed it down to about 100. Um, at that point, I, I got a chance to look at that list, look at list from that was, you know, originally considered and start figuring out what we were going to say, how we were going to talk about it. It was really important to me that this was not a show that was about identity because these works were, while they were all by artists who, um, either self-define as Latinx or who are from Latin America originally and have been living and working in the United States. Um, there was no real um, ne need to focus on who they were, what their backgrounds were, aside from the fact that they had not been recognized before um, from like in a, in a large scale situation um, in, in, in institutions. So in general, it was, it was really an opportunity to, to highlight and celebrate them um, as artists, but really not to focus on, on where they come from necessarily. We wanted to highlight their work. That was really how we were gonna be able to celebrate them best. Um, 
So with that, we, I started looking at the original checklist and coming up with the works that I thought had a really interesting conversation. And um, the first work that was on the checklist is actually um, by an artist named Harvey, uh, sorry, um, Farley Aguilar. And that's called Patriarchy. And they're pulling it up right now. And this is a really big work, um, 93 by 68 inches. So I knew it was going to be pretty imposing. These were really... Um, they're very ghoulish figures to me. They, they sort of invoked this kind of towering um, um, historical photograph and looking more into his practice, it became clear that he really loved looking at old historical photographs and painting from those. And so this to me, it, the title really uh, uh, made it clear that this was a, a, a criticism and, a, and a, a real questioning of these um, long held historical patriarchal roles. So that, that was a really important work to me right off the bat. Right, because and this work, if everybody looks behind me, is going to be on, on this main wall as you enter, enter the gallery. And so as Amethyst mentioned, it's huge. So that's what's going to confront and, and that'll be that first impression as you walk in. Yes, exactly. That was really, that was really important because, I mean, when we were thinking about it, it just, it really set the stage for how much, I mean, if you look at the, um, the colors that he's uses, the jagged lines, the outlines, like everything about it is really, um, is really intense, really haptic, really, really anxiety provoking. And so then it was, it, it was interesting to me that one of the next works that really stood out was um, a work by a duo called Assume Vivid Astrofocus. And it's a neon work that the title of the show comes from, A Very Anxious Feeling. Looks almost as if it was scrawled um, on a piece of paper. And um, we knew that this was a work that they, um, that the collective had created in um, 2007, right before the election of Barack Obama. And they said that they did it because it was just a time of a lot of anxiety. There, there was just this feeling of like, oh my God, what if he doesn't win? Um, which I think so much uh, is, is what a lot of people are feeling at this particular moment. I think um, an election year and compounded by a worldwide pandemic, compounded by um, economic downfall. It's, it's been a really intense period of time for a lot of people. So, um, so the fact that this was a work that was made in 2007 really felt like it could have been made yesterday. It, it just had a lot of, um, a, a lot of importance in this particular moment. And then um, when we were talking originally about the show, I, I said to Joanne and I said to Cindy, well, what are the works that we 100% have to include? Because at this point I love them all, but I know that I need to make some cuts. So um, one of the works that they said was the Jose Alvarez Promised Land. And I was like, well, no, I'm definitely not cutting that. So that's easy. That was that was a one that I that I thought was just so so spectacular. It's kind of hard to see in this, but it's it's reflective. The um, the artist uses crystals and mica and feathers, and it's it's um, it's a really joyous work. And he created this work after he himself was incar incarcerated in um, in a detention center in um, in Miami. He came to the U.S. illegally, and um, he talks openly about this. I'm not sharing anything I shouldn't be sharing. Um, he, he, was, um, he assumed a false identity for 20 years, and he fell in love. He has a husband and a life and a very successful art practice. And, um, and then apparently the real Jose Alvarez came out of the woodwork, and, um, and they, they ended up arresting him um, for being here illegally. He luckily won his appeal and he's still in the US um, living and working in, in Florida. Um, but this was a work that he created right after he got out of the detention center. He talks about how that was a really difficult moment in his life. And for this particular work, it was almost, um, it's almost an antidote to his experience um, his experience being incarcerated, his feelings of hopelessness, his, you know, seeing people coming and going, never really knowing what happened to them. Um, he did a really beautiful series of drawings that I think are going to be at the drawing center in New York um, of people that he met um, because once they realized that he was, you know, an artist and liked to do drawings, people would come and tell them his stories. So 
he, um, he's a really special artist and someone that I think balanced this idea of, of intense anxiety, particularly thinking about art in the present moment, because he has experienced some of the darkest, worst that, um, that hopefully, you know, we will never have that experience. But he, he used that and, and really created something um, spectacular and beautiful in the hope that it could help uh, help others in the future. So, so that those, those works really felt um, like they needed that counterbalance. Uh, the next work is by an artist named Gisela Colon, and um, and this is um, I, I I love this work also. This was one of the works that um, that was like no, we definitely have to include this, which of course I was definitely on board for. But um, this you're you're just gonna. It's also huge. It's eleven. Um, 111 by 34 by 24. So it's this massive monolith. And, um, and she talks about how it's like, you know, it's this amoeba sort of amorphous form that, um, that kind of just both um, radiates and also soaks in light in a kind of a really amazing way. She's clearly interested in a history of minimalism and op art. Um, and, um, and she's taken that these are traditionally male dominated art historical fields and she's really she's really molded it and changed it she's softened it she's made it feminine um she's she's decided that these um these monoliths are um in and of themselves these um sort of power holding receptacles that can um, transform energy, um, the negative to the positive. So, so this also felt to me like a really great way to counterbalance this like very intense feeling of anxiety that I was seeing in so many of the works we were looking at. Um, and so that, those are really the poles, I think, of this exhibition. I think it, there are, you know, artists who are thinking about, um, about migration, they're thinking about labor, they're thinking about untold histories. And, um, and I really, I thought that it could really have, be part of a conversation, which is, you know, anxiety is not great, right? We've been told by our doctors, stop being so anxious and do more exercise and eat healthy. And, um, but the reality is that we have anxiety because as cave people, we had to protect ourselves. We had to, there was, it was a natural response. So we have these feelings because it's, it's human, it's natural. And, um, and the response that we, we take with that, whether it's getting out and protesting or making art or, um, or creating something about the beauty of the world and focusing on that as an act of resistance. Um, it all really came from that feeling um, of anxiety that I thought we could, we could start the conversation on. It's not, it's the, to the title, I, I hope, um, while I mean, it's clearly tied to a specific work, I don't think of every work in the show as, as anxiety provoking. It's kind of what we do as humans with these experiences um, that sometimes we have zero control over. Um, and, and Amethyst, the four that you pointed out are four that, you know, from the installation, the placement that you and Eva selected, you know, are right at the beginning. So the very anxious feeling is uh, you'll see it right as you enter on the wall. As we talked about, uh, the patriotry will be here. And then I'll move over here. And where I'm standing right here will be actually the gazella, right? Mm -hmm. And then behind me on this wall will be the promised land. And so that, you know, you know, the works that you just talked about, you know, really, you know, talk to also that exhibition design and, you know, where you and even, you know, place things. Absolutely. This is, I mean, it's also a unique moment um, for exhibition design because we have to do everything as a one way street, right? Like in any other exhibition, you might be able to walk in and go wherever your heart desires. Um, in this particular exhibition, we are going to lead you through it. Um, not, I mean, obviously there will be stanchions, so you will have to walk a certain way, but we've also thought through it from, um, from a thematic uh, perspective that when you're walking through, we're sort of taking you through this narrative. Obviously, you will still see the Gisela Colon, you'll still see um, the, the, the Jose Alvarez, but as you, you know, the first things you're going to be confronted with is the um, Farley Aguilar and, um, 
there's some, uh, there's, uh, there's so many works. I'm going to start throwing out names, but it's not going to be fair because I can't show you them all. Um, but there's, there's, there's a lot of works in the show. We've packed 74 different works into this exhibition space. So there will be several areas where we will have salon walls, which we'll, we'll talk about later on. Um, but it, it, I, I think that it will give you a lot of different places to enter and a lot of different things to take with you. There's, there's not just one, one thing you're going to take away from this show. I agree. And, you know, if we think about that, we'll pull up the next um, a slide that shows the checklist because, you know, in the curatorial museum world, we talk about a checklist. And so we, we took an example here where, as Amethyst mentioned, we have you know, 74 works and we have 58 artists. And so this is what we take a look at. It has the, the, the image, it has the name of the artist, it has the name of the artwork, it has the dimensions. And in particular for the Beth Root and DeWoody collection, it also has where it's from. If it's from the bunker or the Los Angeles or, um, or New York City. So that is kind of what then the team works with. And on our team, of course, is Eva Thornton, who I mentioned, co-curator along with Amethyst, uh, Mary Lagu, our registrar, and uh, Jim Hudson, who is our gallery uh, exhibition and gallery manager. So that's, you know, that part of the, of the behind the scenes and the terminology that we use. And then, you know, that um, leads into the labels that we're creating, the writing, the research that goes with it. We had four writers on our team uh, that contributed uh, to that part and piece. And um, we are also, for the first time, we're going to be doing our labels in Spanish. So, so that's another part. You got your checklist, you got the labels, you got that research. And, um, you know, I think uh, Amethyst spent many evenings and uh, many weekends doing that research and really diving deep into each artist along with Eva to really get a sense of that, of, you know, that that the process, the place, the message, amplifying the voice. Um, anything else you want to add on, on that part, Amethyst, before we move to your sketches? Yeah, sure. Um, the one thing I will say about putting a checklist together, um, we, we had a checklist and then we started doing research and then we made, we made changes because we, we really wanted to make sure that every work made sense within the exhibition. So, you know, we had an idea, a lot of, most, none of these works had labels before we got to them. So all of the research was stuff that we had to pull out ourselves. And, um, and that, that was helpful because then we found out, you know, some artists weren't actually living in the U.S. or artists who didn't define as Latinx or Latin American or, um, you know, artists who really, it was not, it didn't make sense with this show. So, so it, it kind of went hand in hand. We definitely created a checklist, um, and then went, you know, did research and then revised the checklist. So that was that was a dance that, that took place for um, for several several months. Well, and so we'll screen share first. Um, you know, in this process, especially being virtual, uh, Amethyst shared sketches that she did on paper, and then Jim Hudson shared sketches that he did in terms of the gallery. So these are Amethyst's plans. Um, Very high tech. <laughs> Yep, the high tech <laughs> part exactly. <laughs> and then uh, well, we went to Jim's drawings. Let's show those. And there's more of Amethyst. Yeah. And then Jim came up based on Amethyst drawings and conversations with the team and with Eva looking at you know the checklist and the and of course as we um, have seen Beth DeWoody's collection from the Pan African works that we had on view in 2018. There were a lot of works. And so just the same thing in this gallery as we implement um, a very anxious feeling. So we had four plans that we looked at. And during the pandemic, we have another flow. So, you know, that's one of, you know, if you think about everybody's role in this. So Jim called me down and even said, let's take a look at the model. Let's look at the flow. And so some of that decisions then, you know, is not only the aesthetic part and the messaging and the, and the, the themes, but in this time and place, it's the flow of the in and out and where that traffic is going to be. Yeah, so, exactly. and then we'll head on to the models to the next screen, and we're gonna actually move over to the live model. But Amethyst, I'm gonna let you talk about the installation and working with uh, Eva and Jim, you know, with the phone on top of it and everything. 
Yeah, no, it, it was, it's really fun. So um, a little bit of background about 21C. We have nine locations, but I, um, I'm, I stay in Louisville for the most part, and we do a lot of it um, on, over the phone or um, on, um, through SketchUp, which is like an online sort of modeling format. Um, but I used these models when I worked at the Blanton Museum. So I, I love actually working with models because you can feel spaces in a very different way. They kind of look like a small dollhouse if you haven't had a chance to see one in person. Um, they're really fun. So all of the different pieces have been sized to the actual size you know, of the room. Um, Eva and, and Jim did that um, very tedious task. Um, but when I got on the, on the Zoom call with Eva, she actually put the model on a dolly so she could spin it around. And I would say, okay, let's look at this room again. Let's move this, pull this off the wall. Let's try that here. So it was, it was a different way that she's never worked before in a different way that I've never worked before. It was really fun. Um, this is by no means the final, um, the final layout. Um, although it's, it's not far. Um, it's, it's, it, it, it has, it has shifted several times. So, um, it was, and I, I think I just, I need to, um, footnote. It was actually Jim that started out with, he, he's the one that gave me the images of the layouts, possible layouts first. We talked through their pros and cons. And then we were, I was thinking about how much artwork we have. And I was like, we need to find another wall to place somewhere. So then that's when I started drawing to try to figure out where we could put another wall um, so that it wouldn't interrupt the flow, but we would still have more square footage in order to place artwork and give it some more space. And, um, and just at this point, we'll switch the, um, Laura, we'll switch to the camera on spotlight here because, you know, Amethyst, like you said, those drawings are just the drafts. There is three drafts that we showed as a photo, but here's the real thing on the dolly. And as you can see, so you're entering here and this particular work will be outside the gallery leading you in. You can see the Gisela, you can see the promised land, and you can see just like what we talked about. So you're going in. So Amethyst, this is another view for you. I think first time kind of in, in this way mm -hmm. that you can, you can see um, the model and the exhibition. Yeah, it's really fun. This is, the, yeah, I haven't, I actually haven't looked at it this way yet, so. Um, so, and then we'll, we'll head over, you know, over top. And as Amethyst said, so we have a model like this that was actually, you know, part of um, when we built the building. And um, some of the models were built by the architect, Randall Stout, and others were built in-house. And so we continue to, to use these on a, you know, exhibition rotation. You can see that the, mall, the walls you know, these are movable walls, just like they are in the galleries. Um, and you'll see those being built in other slides by our volunteer uh, team that came in to help uh, Jim and Eva in the gallery. So you can really see now this back wall is very special. So um, those that are familiar with uh, the, the museum and the contemporary gallery, this is a built wall right here because the architect, Randall Stout, this wall is actually slanted. And for many exhibitions, that works very well. For this exhibition, we selected that it would be a straight wall where, you know, we could do salon hanging. There would be, you know, it's at, at, along that space. Oh. And, and you know, with that, I'd love to um, go to the installation and you can see on the screen with the with the slide that this was part of the the building so once amethyst and Eva and Jim selected you know where are the walls gonna go and I came down walked the gallery and I know you know amethyst you walked the gallery with the with through through FaceTime looking through it but this was our team that came in to actually build the walls and put it up. And of course, you know, the painting that takes place um, as well uh, in here. And you know, we can keep going to the next slide. Yeah, we can see the team, you know, not only above, there's the before and after. Uh, and we're right in, in that space right now. So, you know, a couple of the things from the behind the scenes before we move on to the artwork coming to the museum. 
is, you know, talking about, you know, the humidity and the temperature in the galleries. So we keep our temperature at 70 degrees, plus or minus five degrees, and our humidity at 50%, again, plus or minus five. 5%. And we control that and actually see that through, uh, it's called a Metadis system. And so we, we can see for each place in the gallery, we have six uh, data logging systems in the museum. And then Mary Lagu, our registrar, also has a second part where she has an app and she it comes through. So we not only get a call from, you know, we get a call uh, to our operations or facility and our registrar if that goes, if the humidity or temperature moves at all, that we need to, you know, call in Johnson Control on that part of it. And Mary has it on her app as well. And she actually checks with a manual system, um, which is called a sling psychrometer, which then um, gives that manual check and balance. So that's kind of that temperature and humidity behind the scenes. And then I'd love to show the lighting part, uh, and we'll move over to this cart. And Eva Thornton, our co-curator of this exhibition, but she wears many hats like we do, and so she is in charge of the lighting. And this is a, a light meter. And so, you know, within the gallery, it depends on the works of art. And Amethyst, I know in this exhibition, we have different uh, um, foot candles that we'll be making to be aware of if it's, we need low light levels, somewhere below 12, or a kind of that normal 24 to 30. And each gallery, you know, there's some natural light that comes in. And so we're aware of that. And that also influences the exhibition design. So if I go over to this wall, for example, this one then is, um, you know, under, it's about seven uh, foot candles here on the light meter. And, you know, it's a little bit darker in this area. And if I go over, you know, naturally right now where the lights are, if I go over to the other side, Yeah, you can see that the light is higher. This is about at 15. And so that kind of gives you an idea of, the, of what it is currently. We do have one wall on the other side that is a natural part in there that's around that 24. So that influences also, you know, where we're placing things in the exhibit design. And I know you talked about that with, um, you know, Eva and Jim and Mary as, we are looking at that exhibition design amethyst. Right, yeah, not only for the protection of the specific works of art, because works on paper are more delicate, we don't want to expose them um, to light in the same way that we could to um, a, you know, a panel painting, um, but also because there are some works that look better in specific lights than in others. So um, for example, I was corresponding with um, Ramiro Gomez's gallery in Los Angeles and they were like, well, whatever you do, make sure it gets a lot of light because it neat, it looks great in a lot of light. And the same um, the same thing we were hearing from um, from the from Laura and Maynard, which was, you know, this work looks great when you have a lot of light on it. We need to put a lot of light so that it reflects. Um, so there, there we were trying to, you know, every exhibition is a balance of, you know, trying to figure out the thematic conversations, but also um, where it's safest and best from, uh, from, for the work, for the viewers. Um, there's a lot of different stakeholders every time you put together an exhibition that you're taking into consideration. That is true. And that's one of the last things as we bring in our pencil lift. And in this gallery, we have, you know, a natural right up here behind me is about 18 feet in terms of the ceiling height. And in the highest, it's about 24 feet. And I'll show, you know, like, like, um, Amethyst said, you know, there's these different uh, requests of lighting. And so we have LED lights in here. And as uh, Eva uses the light, uh, meter, then she can take that and she can dim or you know, on, on up or down on terms of the lighting. You can see the inside here and there's different gels and, and lights that can go into this. And I'll show a couple on that because that kind of tells that story of, you know, that behind the scenes, what Eva is doing. So within that, we have, for example, a circle light. 
uh, where you can put that in and you'll get a nice about six foot diameter. And then this other one is going to be really more of a, a spot on that. So it'll get tighter and we'll have a nice tight spot. Uh, she also uses these. So this, you can see the difference between, you know, these two right here as we, as we focus in. So this one right here will have more of a flare as you can see from that part where this one will have more of a circular. And then she uses uh, the screens that go in front. So in terms of, you know, a tighter, more diffused, and you can see the, the screening on that that would go on top of that, um, or something that is more large. And you can then, and you know, she'll do horizontal or vertical, depending on what, what she needs for each work and, you know, what you'll see. So when you come back into the galleries, um, I know that, you know, you'll look at the lighting differently as well. And, you know, there's one more I'd like to share is, you know, this part where it won't, it's a black part that goes on top. And that is a particular so that if you are looking up, that it won't go into your eye. So she doesn't use that everywhere because if it's spotlighted on the wall, she doesn't need it. But if it's spotlight somewhere else, that way, um, you know, it's not hurting the visitor's eye as they're going through. So that's a little bit about, about the lighting part from both the technical, but what you heard from Amethyst as the artist are, um, and the collections team from the Beth DeWoody are talking about each piece. So we'll go back to the screen share and see the next parts on, you know, the crates coming in. This is a really exciting day when the crates come in. I got a text message from Eva that's like, it's Christmas. Um, so it's, it's always, it's like, you know, you get all these packages that you, you know, you have an idea about what's in it, but you don't really know until you, you open it up and get a chance to look at it. So it's, it's a very exciting time when the artwork actually arrives. That is true. And so we're moving to the next gallery to actually show the crates. But I know, you know, that we, we received um, three shipments, one larger shipment from the bunker in Florida, and then two smaller shipments from Los Angeles and from New York City. And of course, you know, Mary and Eva are receiving that along with the rest of the team. And I know if we can show those other images as we walk and change galleries. You'll see that there are several different kinds of packing. Um, so if it's in a, a cardboard box, like the one um, that you see on the right right now, that's called a soft pack. Actually, I think all two of these are soft packs. Um, it doesn't mean that, you know, they're not safe. It's just that's how they're packaged. Um, it's very heavy to move plywood boxes around. So oftentimes um, it works out really well to use cardboard. Um, and then there are some that are called slat crates, which are partially wood um, and then covered over with plastic, which allows, um, allows for larger works that sometimes wouldn't normally, wouldn't fit necessarily on a, on a truck or a freight um, carrier. But if they're in a slat crate that gives us some more flexibility or more room, still really rigid and still really safe. Um, but maybe not for long-term storage, more for transportation. Um, some of these works have been already pulled out from their boxes. So you could, these were probably, um, I, I wasn't there, but I, I do, I also at 21C wear a lot of hats. So um, I, my ind indication to me is that these were already pulled out of the box that they had been um, put in bubble wrap and um, the bubble wrap had been taken off. And right now we're looking at the the work in plastic. And we plastic these works um, in order to keep uh, water and moisture out. So they do it in a certain way so that there is some, they're able to exchange air um, with some small air pockets, but for the most part, um, it's been sealed up so that, you know, if, if God forbid there is a leak on, um, on a transportation truck, that the works will not be damaged. Right, and that's a good lead in to, you know, the condition reporting. So, uh, and I've switched galleries. So I'm in the special exhibition gallery where, you know, at the, the last exhibition in here was Pop Power. And so right now we won't be having an exhibition in here. So we're staging a lot of the crates. 
So you can see uh, to, to my right is the Gacella. You can see this large crate here. So Amethyst is exciting to, you know, see in the space. You can even imagine, you know, that, um, you know, that height and that, Im you know, that impression that will, that artwork will, will take. So that one's right here, and Amethyst was kind of going over, you know, you've got the different kinds of, you know, there's a crate right over here are bin boxes where there's multiple works kind of that came in, and the soft packing, as, um, as she indicated, as, as well as travel frames. And we have a couple of those examples in the back where you do see um, the wrapping on the front. And one of the things with the Beth DeWoody collection is that she has her own ID number. So we're making sure that we are on, we're keeping her IDs as well as our loan numbers. So once they're unpacked, we keep everything. We keep all of the packaging, we keep the crates, uh, because we're going to, you know, after the deinstall, then we are also packing them back to be transported back to West Palm Beach. Uh, Los Angeles and New York City. And so one of those things, because you can imagine after, you know, four months on view, five months, you know, you're not going to remember exactly how each one came in. So with the unpacking comes a very much of a how-to photo, uh, you know, agenda so that, you know, when you c go back and you repack it, you know, and the team remembers how it was packed and, in, and of course each crate and box is marked as you can see. And this one right here um, is, is the work that we're gonna be talking about with the, in the structural part. And this one has a, you know, the soft packing, it's textile, so it's wrapped up where the one right next to it isn't a hard wood box in a crate. And I will say, you know, from the condition reports, you know, we, you know, the, each collection will let us know if there's something that we have to watch out for. And in one of the works, we received, you know, the call beforehand that there is some flaking on the paint. And so that way we know that beforehand and Mary, the registrar is checking that um, and, and notes that in the condition report as it comes in and of course, as it goes out. So anything else you'd like to add on, you know, so Amethyst, I don't think you saw this part yet. So no, this is, you know, all the works that are, are up and, and staged, they're staged and they're ready. The um, gallery, as everyone saw, the, the walls are in, it's been painted, and now it's, it's ready and, and the model's finished. So it is in the final form and the labels, they're in the edit form yet. So they'll be, they'll be sent out shortly. Um, to print and then you know it gets started with the with the installation and that will lead us into this next part where we're, um, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the challenges of installing. Yeah absolutely so I think the the next slide um, is a really really fun work that we were, it's actually gonna be the first work that you see when you um, when you walk um, to go into the exhibition. It'll be outside of the exhibition. It will greet you there. Um, this is by Raul de Nieves. He is originally from Mexico, but lives and works in Brooklyn, New York now. He was included in the 2017, I think, Whitney Biennial. He did these really beautiful stained glass windows. They weren't actually stained glass. They were collaged from um, a lot of found, uh, pieces of um, uh, mylar, different colored mylar. He really loves using non-traditional art materials like so many artists in this exhibition. Um, and this is, a, I mean, you, you can tell that, you know, this, the, it comes in multiple pieces. So when this, um, this gets installed, there's actually an armature on which um, <clears throat> sort of the, the figure sits and hangs. Um, and then the, the pieces around it, all the stones around it, um, are placed differently every time. And that, that's something that, you know, the artist has, has made clear in his, in his or her, whoever the artist is, whoever, whoever is making a work um, that is going to change whenever it's installed, um, they, um, they change their, they, they know that it's going to change every time. So this, um, this is how it looked in the bunker. It will look a little bit different, um, although basically the same um, at, at the Taubman Museum. Um, 
But this was another work that we felt was um, was really interesting in, in sort of thinking about this transition between worlds. Um, Psychopomp is actually um, a Greek uh, figure who would lead um, souls from the realm of the living to the afterlife. So, um, so this is an artist who's really thinking about, about that transition between life and death. He was always interested and inspired by Mexican artisans. So a lot of the work that he does um, is really based in craft and thinking about the traditional artwork that he grew up with and um, also a reusing and a recycling of materials. So a lot of the materials that you'll see on this are things that, that he's found um, in, in, um, in thrift stores or, or discarded. Um, he has a really fun Art 21 video that you can watch on YouTube. Um, he's a, he's a, he, he also, you can follow him on Instagram too. He's, he's a lot of fun um, to watch and to, to learn from and listen to, but this will be a great work, I think, as you walk in. But I think at first glance, it really seems like a, like a kind of a, a complex installation. We, we found out from the from the Dewitty collection that it's not nearly as complex as it looks, which is grateful, which we're all very grateful for. Um, but we also love the fact that every time it's going to look a little bit different because no one's going to arrange the rocks the same way. Um, and that that's very intentional on the artist's part. And this one, like uh, Amanda said, will be in the gallery, the optical cable gallery hallway. It will be on a platform. So it's a six uh, foot diameter and um, four inch high and so it will look a little bit different but that'll that'll help with the lead in into the gallery and then I think the next the next one on the slides uh, include the salon and then the structural yeah so what we mentioned earlier was that um, because there are so many works we had to um, and 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 thematically it made sense there were there were clearly groupings of works that had conversations with each other so um, so this is one we have three different salon walls this is probably this is the smallest one the next slide um, shows the the bigger one um, this slide will be um, basically right across from the Farley Aguilar right as you walk in so it'll be sort of this first um, first wall really of work that you will encounter and the works will sort of span um, a pretty high spread so um, there's like a, a, a bird figure in the left hand corner, that's actually gonna be hanging uh, from the ceiling. And then the sign at the bottom that says against stupidity, um, that is actually gonna be on the floor leaning against the wall. So you have to imagine, this is not the final configuration um, of how this is going to go, but these, all of these works will be, um, be on the same wall in conversation with each other. And when we talk about salon style figura configurations, we're, um, we're thinking back to those 18th century um, paintings or drawings where you, or, uh, you, you, or photographs, historical photographs, where you see basically floor to ceiling just stacked on walls, it, it, you know, image after image after image. Um, so that, that's sort of what we were, we were thinking about with this. This is, um, this is a little bit different because there's multi, there's, you know, lots of different materials. The, the hanging bird is by an artist named Rafa Esparza. And these are actually, um, it's a bird that he has pull, created from pulled apart Nike Cortez um, high top trainer, so shoes. Um, and then um, there's like a sort of a, a long thin line, it's, it's a little hard to tell, you're just gonna have to believe me, um, of, of small houses and those are all, um, they're made of soap. They're bars made of. Uh, they're soap bars that have been carved into little houses, and that's by an artist named Angel Delgado. And he's originally from Cuba, but has lived in exile in Mexico and the United States uh, for the past uh, thirty years. And he's really thinking about his time um, when he was imprisoned in Cuba um, and sort of how that it continues to haunt him. Um, so anyway, there's there's a even within a salon style wall, we've kind of taken that historical model and turned it a little on its head because we're, we're, um, we're including a lot of different kinds of works here as well. Um, yeah, the labels, you can see the label didactic is really large sort of wrote, written out on that. It's not going to, I mean, obviously just bear with us every, take everything with salt on with these right now, but it is going to be a pretty large um, label didactic because we have labels in English and in Spanish and while I was, I was given and I kept to the hundred and 
50 word limit per, um, per label. There were still, if you imagine that those translated as about 300 words per work. So it ends up being a lot of text. We felt that these works really needed to be contextualized in order to, you know, for whoever wants to read them. Obviously, I don't imagine that anybody, everybody's going to read every work, every label. Um, but if someone wanted to, they could. <laughs> And the hope that there is something exciting on this wall um, that will make you want to read the labels, that's, that's the hope, that it will be there for you if you want it. Yeah, so these are, so this is by Leonardo Benzant, Black Joy Takes Courage. This is also falling into um, the counter, the counter part to anxiety, right? How to, um, how to fight um, uh, discrimination with with joy and resistance. So, um, Black Joy Takes Courage is uh, this this work that actually comes off of the wall about forty eight inches. So it'll ha it hangs. It's on the wall, but it hangs off um, off from the ceiling as well. You can kind of see the the um, the monofilaments in that in that particular image, but. The placement of this work was also, you know, intentional because we had to consider specific structural elements above that would allow us to be able to hang this. Um, it's all, it's made of, um, of beads and, um, and leather and different, you know, acrylic and different pieces. So it's not, I don't believe that it's very heavy, but it's definitely not light. So, um, so we had to be able to use the structures within within the spaces that that made sense for us to hang this one. And then the next one is by Eddie Rodolfo Aparicio, and this is actually two sided. So you, you we needed people to be able to walk around it, and um, these are all found fabric clothing um, pieces that he has like. So, soaked in resin or pine and then um, wrapped them around trees in, um, in Los Angeles. And these are trees that have often, you know, like the marks that you see in trees on near, near stop, uh, bus stops that say, you know, um, Eddie loves Maria or whatever. And these, these he was able to, when he, we, he wrapped these cloths around the trees, he was able to um, pull the the paint that was on them, the writing that was on them, the carved um, engravings into of, of these trees onto these clothing, these clothing or or or, or found cloths um, that he um, that he created this work with, and a lot of these were he's he is of Salvadorian descent. His family migrated to the United States. Um, but he, he's from here originally, but he's really thinking about the process of migration, the stories we carry with us, the things that that continue to mark us um, both both physically and emotionally. So um, he's thinking about the parallels between how we treat the environment and how we we treat migrants. Um, so there's there's a lot to unpack in this work. It's also really large. It's 118 inches long by 118 inches tall. So imagining where we were going to place that, where you could walk around it completely, um, was was also was also part of it. And I I don't know how heavy it is, but I can't imagine that it's particularly light. Um, so right. anyway, those were those were the two works that we wanted to point out as particularly um, complex installs. Right. Thank you, Amethyst. And, and as you come, you know, into the gallery, this opens to members on October 2nd and then to the public on Saturday, October 3rd. And of course, you know, that following week, we'll have our member exclusive hours as well. Um, you saw kind of that behind the scenes, but when you come in, I know you'll, you'll have kind of a different light of that, you know, imagining walking through the model, seeing those works of art, the lighting, um, thinking about that temperature and the humidity, but also, you know, the flow and the themes and the selections of work um, in, you know, that, that thoughtful and careful manner um, with the thread going through um, the labels, of course, as the interpretive uh, pro, uh, part of the materials. Uh, also in Spanish, we'll have an audio component as well. And so we are working with Dr. Elda Stanko Downey in the community. She has identified 12 um, people in our community that Spanish is their first language from all different industries that are going to be coming in when Amethyst is in town at the end of September and beginning of October before we open. 
in order to pick a work that speaks to them. They'll read the label in Spanish, but then they'll also talk um, about what, you know, kind of that outside eyes concept of what speaks to them and uh, tell their story as well in Spanish. So that's a new component we're very excited to do as well as a catalog. So Amethyst and the team um, with Laura Devorkin as the designer from um, Beth DeWoody's team and um, Eva and, and we have a number of artists that um, have submitted essays. So we'll be featuring, I think we're up to maybe nine Amethyst um, as well as uh, some new things with Instagram takeovers. And um, I'll uh, throw it back to you, Amethyst, regarding our Art 21 connection, which we're really excited about. Yeah, this is really exciting. Um, Cindy, so Art 21, if you're not familiar, they're um, a really great organization that has pr been producing um, art is like short form documentaries about specific artists. And in recent years, they've been focusing on specific locations. Um, for many years, it was just, you know, various artists that they wanted to highlight all over this, um, this year, they're focusing on, um, four different locations, London, uh, uh, Beijing, the borderlands, and then, um, one more that I can't remember, but the most important part is that the Borderlands series is going to feature an artist in, in our show, Tanya Aguiniga, and she is a fascinating artist. Um, we Eva and I had actually done a lot of, had a lot of conversations with her, about her with, um, with other members of the team, basically saying she is a brilliant speaker. Anything I could find on the internet or YouTube about her was so fun to watch. She's a performance artist. Um, she works with her community. She um, she creates these really beautiful furniture works and 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 um, also works in jewelry. She just she does everything in a really cool, really unique way. She uh, grew up between. Um, literally gr moving between um, San Diego and Tijuana. She, her, she was ra raised and lived in, in Tijuana um, and went to school. Her grandmother lived in San Diego. So she, she really, she made that cross over the border trip every single day, which is something that many people do in this country. Um, so anyway, we found out, uh, it, Cindy actually brought it to our attention. She's like, the new season is coming out. Guess who they're going to feature? <laughs> we, should, we should show this and we should have a conversation with her, which was great because we'd already sort of said like, ding, ding, ding. We, wanna, we definitely want to feature, feature her. Um, so mark your calendars. I think we're going to request it. So it's still, you know, a, we haven't confirmed it completely, but November 12th, I think we're going to hopefully screen the film um, online so you can watch it wherever. Um, and then I think we're hoping to do an artist conversation with her, obviously long distance on the Sunday following. I think it's the 15th between the, the um, art 21 screening and her talk. We're hoping that she will take over um, the Taubman's Instagram, which um if you are familiar with Instagram, um, it is an opportunity essentially for um, one person to post whatever they want, um, what, you know, what they're making in their studio, what they're having for breakfast, their, their dogs, their children, their backyard, essentially to give us a kind of a, a behind the scenes look at how, you know, what she's doing and what she's thinking about. Um, and she'll do it on the Taubman's Instagram. So it'll sort of, you know, say like, hey, I'm... Tanya Aguiniga, I'm going to be taking over Instagram and showing you what I'm doing in my house today um, or in my studio today or whatever it is that she wants to share. And the beauty is that, you know, as the Talbot Museum, we don't really have any control over it. We kind of give that over to the artist, um, trust that they are going to, um, that they're going to share and, and, um, and show us something that we otherwise wouldn't have seen. And, and that's really another portion of, of this exhibition. We wanted to be able to um, not only highlight their artwork, but also their individual voices. Um, so that was one way to do it because obviously we're in a, we're in a real weird COVID world, but it also allows us to have even more programming with artists than we might normally have. Um, obviously all virtual. Um, but additionally in the, in the, um, in the catalog, which I'm really excited about, we, we invited um, nine artists. I'm not sure. I don't think that we have probably eight at this point who've, who've signed on and said, okay, but we gave them a prompt to think about and consider um, and a word limit, although no one has listened to the word limit. Um, yeah, and, <laughs> 
that word limit. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I, I have, I have no interest in trying to cut them off. I, if it fits on the page, I'm happy to keep it. But, um, but anyway, it, it's been a lot of fun to see what has come in thus far and to be able to, uh, to share their voices in written form and, you know, online and virtual form as well. I agree.